Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We left. We were trying to back over. Currently doing an autism. The 2007 NBA betting scandal dealt a serious blow to professional sports when referee Tim Donaghy admitted involvement in an illegal gambling conspiracy. Sean Patrick Griffin documents the scandal in Gaming the Game, which ESPN's True Hoop blog described as an exhaustively researched book that, quote, delivers the intrigue you'd expect from a true crime thriller. A former Philadelphia police officer turned professor and author, Griffin teaches criminal justice at Penn State Abington and has written two books on African-American organized crime, one of which has been optioned to be made into a motion picture. Here's our conversation with Sean Patrick Griffin. Sean Patrick Griffin, welcome to the conversation. Thanks for having me. Your newest book is Gaming the Game, the story of the NBA betting scandal and the gambler who made it happen. But before we turn to what is a, a fascinating book, how did a Philadelphia police officer come to be a criminal justice professor and an author? Well, the short version of the story is ha if I had my druthers, I would have gone straight from undergrad through grad and become a professor and an author without ever being a police officer. It turned out that I owed quite a bit of uh, student loans and my father was a Philadelphia police officer, my brother was a Philadelphia police officer, and the department was hiring right as I was graduating with my undergraduate degree. And so I literally went on the police force as a means of paying back loans, knowing all the while if I could, I'd come back and get my PhD and ultimately go into academia in the first place. I can't help but think though that that connection has, has paid off in spades uh, for all three of your books. Oh yeah, no, it was a really big deal. Now, I can't take credit for this. That was never the plan, but it obviously helped me with understanding how the process works. It gave me access to great interview subjects. It gave me access to data that other researchers may not have access to. It has allowed me to network in ways that I can't even imagine would have would been like had I not had the experience. So it's definitely benefited my research, that's for sure. And it also helps my teaching because I'm always able to explain how certain things that we may read about in textbooks or in academic literature don't necessarily pan out that way in real life. And also, obviously, I have a much more critical eye toward public policy because I know how bureaucracies work. You've been there. Right. Been there, done that. Right. Uh, before we talk about gaming the game, um, I, I wanted to go back to a conversation we had several years ago, ongoing conversations about uh, two books that you did earlier in your career, both about the Black Mafia and Black Brothers, Inc., The Violent Rise and Fall of the Philadelphia Black Mafia. Last time we talked, it had been optioned for a Hollywood movie. Where does that stand? It is still option to be made into at least one motion picture. The deal is technically for three, uh, broken by time periods, but it's with Warner Brothers and uh, it's currently under the, uh, how would you say, it's under the management of Appian Way Productions, which is Leonardo DiCaprio's production company. Which must be pretty exciting. Oh yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's been an interesting but frustrating process because it just takes so long. Uh, luckily, I, I've seen the script, and uh, we're currently in the third version of the script, but the first two were incredible. And if the third is anywhere near as good as the first two, I'll be entirely happy. And, and the reason that there are three scripts is this is a, is a very deep, complicated, multifaceted story about the Black Mafia and Philadelphia, uh, beginning in the late 1960s for about 20 years, uh, how they terrorized that city. Um, and, and it sounds like it's being done similarly to The Godfather as a trilogy. Well, the thing was, Black Brothers, when I wrote that book, and it's admittedly a dense book, it was never really meant to be optioned into a Hollywood film. It was meant to answer certain historical questions. Well, if you're talking about decades of history and dozens of characters, you can't do that in a three-hour film. So it made sense when they started discussing how to make that creatively into a film that you would do films by, de films by time period, which is what they're doing. Speaking of characters, let's move to gaming the game. There are a lot of interesting characters in this book, uh, beginning with referee uh, Tim Donaghy and Jimmy Batista, Jimmy Baba, the black sheep Batista, who is the, the professional gambler who, uh, who was uh, an integral part of this whole story. How did you come to tell this story? What attracted you to this story? 
Well, I was, like many sports fans, I was familiar with the story. The, the story broke into the news in the summer of 2007, and I had been following the news just because it was a noteworthy story. Here you had a referee involved in a betting scandal. and An NBA were, referee. Right, and people were debating whether the games were fixed and whether there was mafia involvement and all this stuff. So I was following the news like everyone else. The reason I got involved in the project is because, ironically, I was out promoting Black Brothers Incorporated, and I was at a function where I ran into somebody who asked me if I was remotely familiar with the scandal, uh, in which I did, yeah. And they said, well, would you be interested in meeting one of the conspirators? And this person knew somebody who knew Jimmy Batista. And I said, sure. And at that point in time, I didn't really know if there was a story to research or a story to tell, because it was national news. And I kept thinking, well, what could be left out of the news? I met with Batista for about half of an hour and knew immediately that what the public knew was either superficial at best or be wildly misleading, and that was for a reason. No one had ever spoken to the gambler. No one had ever spoken to the other professional gamblers who, until Gaming the Game came out, people didn't even know there were other professional gamblers betting on these games. And everyone was taking as gospel Tim Donaghy's account of this, which he wrote in his memoir, I guess, uh, Personal Foul. Right. Well, at the, in March of 08, when I started this project, at that point, all three conspirators were going through the criminal justice process. And what little we knew was based exclusively on what Donaghy had told the FBI. He was the lead conspirator who had cooperated with the federal government and pleaded guilty. Well, part of the reason that all we knew as newsreaders about the story was from Tim Donaghy was because his story is all the FBI had to go on. And there's a reason for that, and I'll try and be as brief as I can. Batista never cooperated, so the FBI had no, no access to him or especially his betting records. The third conspirator was a friend of theirs from high school named Tommy Martino. These are three guys from Cardinal O'Hara High School, Catholic right. High School in Philadelphia. Right, in the suburb of Philadelphia, right, in Delaware County. So when, what, what the public didn't know was that Tommy Martino had perjured himself before a grand jury. He later uh, tried cooperating with the government, but of course if you're the feds and you've got three conspirators, the only way to vet Tommy, t Tim Donaghy's statements is, well, Batista's not available, and Tommy Martino may now be telling the truth, but we don't really know. He perjured himself already. So they had no means to determine the validity of Tim Donaghy's statements for the most part. So Tim Donaghy's statements and his plea deal carried the news stories for a year and a half. And then, as you say, his book came out in late 2009, which was even more far afield from the facts uh, than his original statements to the FBI. And now, I'm not critical of the FBI in the book because, as I just explained, through no fault of their own, they didn't have access to the people and the data that I did. And they were going to get a charge. Right. And he, even, pleaded even guilty, all... and he pleaded guilty to fraud. So their job was done. It's not as though he denied defrauding the NBA. What, what they couldn't see was, was he fixing games? How many games were a part of the scandal? Things like that. Well, they were mainly concerned about, did he defraud the NBA in the 06-07 season? And he admitted he did, and their job was done. Batista didn't talk to the FBI, but he talked to you. Why did he talk to you? He never wanted be, to be a rat. He's adamant about saying, I would never let others take the fall for my mistakes or my misdeeds. So he had no problem not putting other people in prison, but, had, but was perfectly comfortable explaining the mechanics of the scandal and the logistics of it after he had served his time in federal prison. He spent 15 months in, in a Brooklyn prison. Meanwhile, Donaghy uh, spent his time in what many would say was a country club. This, right. this ticked Batista off. Well, Donaghy, of course, because he pleaded guilty and cooperated with the government, was sentenced to a uh, minimum security prison in Florida. Um, as you say, some call them white collar uh, camps. Batista was sent to a, uh, a legitimate federal detention center in Brooklyn. And Batista, as I say in the book, he is convinced to this day that he was sent there as payback uh, or as a means of breaking him and hoping to get his cooperation. Uh, that, of course, never happened, but that was his, that's his interpretation of those events, that he got sentenced to a serious prison uh, because he did not cooperate with the feds. And one of the things that we'll never know the FBI was and is still investigating offshore sports books, and they had hoped, it's believed, to, to get Batista not only to flip about the NBA scandal, but especially about that entire netherworld of offshore sports betting. And they hoped perhaps by putting him in a major prison that he would have... You and know, he didn't. No, he didn't. He didn't reconsider. He served his entire time there. Tell us, what is the link be between sports betting and organized crime? Well, in my research, this book was primarily about professional sports gamblers. These are white-collar gamblers, what they literally bet for a living. They're unbelievably smart. Most of them are college-educated. They have no involvement whatsoever with organized crime. 
Batista is not college educated. In fact, got into this because uh, he was good at it and, and felt like he could do this better than he could other things because of the lack of a college right. education. Well, Batista is considered a professional gambler because he, like the people I just described, bet for a living. You're right, he's A, not college educated, and B, was never a gambler in the sense that many viewers would think. And let me explain that briefly. Batista in the trade is what was considered a mover, meaning professional gamblers who want to bet $1 million or $2 million a game need the services of somebody like a Jimmy Batista who can get you $10,000 here, $50,000 there. Collectively, he'll get you your proposition at $1 or $2 million a game. The problem is, of course, sports books, whether they're in Las Vegas or offshore, won't take that kind of bet in a lump sum because it would require them now to get that much money on the other side of that bet so that they don't lose money. So Batista's expertise was he had this entire network around the country and indeed around the world that at the snap of a finger, he could get that kind of money down on a particular bet. And in the end, though, despite the fact that he wasn't really a gambler at heart, he lost millions. By the time this whole thing broke, he owed millions. Well, he claims, uh, there's no reason to dispute this, but his version of that is, by the time that this NBA scandal ends in the spring of 2007, he was heavily addicted to prescription pills. As a result of which, now he had never bet his entire life. He didn't claim to know anything about betting. He wasn't a handicapper. He wasn't like the sharp guys which, whom, with whom he aligned himself. But because he was addicted to pills, he was playing online poker. And because his credit lines were so astronomically high, he could easily get into debt in ways that you and I couldn't because his credit lines allowed him to get that big in debt. So he's working with guys who go by the names of the Chinaman, uh, the Englishman. Uh, he's the sheep, uh, right. Baba the black sheep. Well, Baba Black Sheep, as you know, uh, and readers of the book will know, actually, that nickname was given to him by his family. He was the Black Sheep of, of the, the family. family. Right. It's not as though his buddies <laughs> on a corner or in the playground gave him that name. His family gave him that name. He comes from a very ordinary, normal family. His sister, one sister is a captain in the Navy. Another is a nurse who's married to a, a doctor. And then there's Jimmy. And he's always been on the edge. He's never been a violent criminal or anything, but he's always been involved in hustling. And that's why he liked bookmaking and betting. It was, almost, it was a quasi-legitimate lifestyle. So, so again, he, he was not a mobster. Oh, no, no, not, none whatsoever. And in fact, I describe in the book, when he was operating in the early 90s just outside of Philadelphia, he fled the Philadelphia area precisely because of fear of the Philly mob coming out into the suburbs and extorting bookmakers. What's the link between... Uh uh, sports betting and college? Well, there are many. I give uh, two examples in the book. Batista's expertise, in addition to getting money down on games for big time clients, was getting inside information. Uh, and what had happened over the years for somebody like Batista, so many people owed him money that could never repay the debt. Their way of repaying debts was giving inside information. They're suddenly vulnerable. Exactly. Just like an athlete can become, who gambles, can right. become vulnerable. And so one of the examples in the book is a college referee, another is a college coach who used to give one pick per week as a means of uh, helping these pro gamblers. And so with respect to college gambling, there are people like Batista, now the games are not being fixed, at least based on what I researched, but there are people who are providing information about material that the public would not know about, whether it's who comes in late at night, who's having problems with their girlfriends, all those sorts of things are being provided to professional gamblers, especially from college athletes who owe money to bookmakers. To what extent is all of this a game changer? Okay, we've gotten uh, Jimmy Batista, you know, he's now managing a, a fitness center. Um, has this changed how the NBA operates? What can be done to prevent another Tim Donaghy from, from doing the kinds of things he did? These questions all, I could give our responses <laughs> to each of these. All right, with respect to the NBA sp specifically, the NBA claims in response to the scandal that they've instituted certain reforms. So, for instance, one thing they did do is they now, they now provide the NBA referee list to the public. That used to be a confidential matter so that the public wouldn't know what referee crew was operating certain games. Well, that's now public. They argued that that was part of the problem. The rest of that is a little more complicated, and in the appendix of the, bo of the book, I mentioned briefly, the NBA conducted what was called the Pedowitz study. Larry Pedowitz was an attorney who was hired to do a study on the NBA betting scandal, and they produced a report that's widely considered the Pedowitz report. My problems with the Pedowitz report, though, are that 
Martina, Martino, Batista, and Donaghy, none of them cooperated with the NBA. The FBI did not allow its agents to speak to the NBA, and they didn't provide any of the files to the NBA. And they didn't talk with you. No, they refused to. They still, to this day, have never responded to any of my correspondence before, the, during the research of the book or after it was published, and I have asked multiple times. So as far as my confidence in the NBA's response to the scandal, I don't know how anyone would be confident in their response to the scandal because we don't know what they're doing other than the referee uh, announcements. But as far as being able to ferret out somebody like Tim Donaghy, I don't know that that's possible or, or I should say any more possible because they've not told us what's going on. Batista, it's an interesting story. Uh, here he is. You mentioned that he was a, a drug addict, basically. He was addicted mm -hmm. to uh, Oxycontin and, and cocaine. And here he was, though, Mr. Mom, in the morning getting his three young daughters off to school. But here's a guy who is literally imprisoned by his cell phone and his flat screen TV and his computers. Well, his operation was remarkably complicated, where he's literally operating out of the home in his regular suburban home. If you walked into his house, immediately on the left, there was a regular office, and it was nothing but a maze of computer screens, computers, and flat screen televisions. I, at one point, I think there were actually 18 computer screens, monitoring betting lines from around the world, where he would also speak through Skype through the computer to all of his contacts around the world. He had a cell phone bag. Each of his clients, his exclusive clients, got their own cell phone number so that they would never be competing for his time. And he would carry this bag around everywhere he went. And every night, if you actually went to his home, you would see all the cell phones lit up charging for the next day. It's, in, it's difficult, unless people read the book, to ex express to people how complicated and serious these people are about their business. What did his wife think he was doing? Oh, his wife knew exactly okay. what he was doing, as did his children, by the way. Um, in his world, and by the way, all of his neighbors knew. Everybody knew that Jimmy Batista was a professional gambler. He never hid it from anybody, nor does any, everyone else I talk about in the book. They all tell, their IRS returns say okay. professional gambler. Okay, and, and, he, and he filed, he, he declared his earnings and, yes. and paid taxes on them. Right. Oh, well, that's the one thing anyone who reads the book will realize. Professional gamblers are far less fearful of taking a gambling arrest than they are of a tax evasion arrest. Misdemeanor gambling arrest, anybody can take an arrest for that and get a slap on the wrist and a fine. Tax evasion or money laundering, those are significant charges and you'll go to prison. So they all made sure they paid their taxes. The interesting thing about this, too, is, uh, you know, online gambling is, is uh, illegal. Uh, the kind of offshore betting that, that you talk about, the infrastructure and all of that you talk about in your book, all of that is illegal. Is, is the Justice Department turning a blind eye and why were they particularly interested in this case? Well, with respect to the Justice Department turning a blind eye, they've known about most, most of what I describe in the book, everybody who has cared to know has known about for a long time. They may not have known the particulars of the mechanics of how money was laundered from offshore sports books from Curacao or Antigua into the United States. That might be new in gaming the game, but everyone knew that there was offshore sports betting going on. The FBI and the Department of Justice for years has claimed to have been seeking people out. The problem, of course, is are the operators U.S. based? That's easier for them to prosecute, though still rare. If somebody, however, is housed offshore entirely, our jurisdiction's a matter of question. Um, for the most part, the Justice Department never goes after gamblers. People typically either go after the bookmakers, low level bookmakers on the street corner who are taking bets, or if a sports book was stupid enough to actually be housed in the United States, they'll go after them. But as it is now, the only thing the Justice Department goes after are what are called payment processing centers. If an offshore sports book enlists the services of a bank or any other processing center in the United States and the Justice Department finds out about it, they will shut that bank down or, sport, or, or processing center down and they'll find them and prosecute them. But what I describe in the book is there are ways to get around that and that has been untouched for years. Hmm. Donaghy, uh claims and, and says that the FBI concurs and that the NBA concurs that he never fixed a game that he officiated. Batista doesn't believe that. B well, Batista doesn't believe it. The pro gamblers who were betting on Donaghy's games for four seasons don't believe it. That's why they were betting millions of dollars on his games and his games only. And he had a 78% winning streak right. or a winning, a winning record. percentage on his games right and with respect to the claim that the f that the fbi and or the nba concluded that donaghy didn't fix games let's break that down too because the fbi 
fought with Tim Donaghy, and I explain this in the book. This is the first time anyone has ever spoken to the FBI agents and the U.S. attorney's officials who actually worked these cases. The FBI fought with him tooth and nail about what he admitted, what he was going to admit to. They would not agree to a plea deal with him unless he admitted that he at least may have subconsciously fixed games. They rejected the notion that you could have a financial interest in a game, in his case a bet, and not have it affect your on-court performance. And so his plea deal reads that he may have altered outcome, game outcomes. So he, they certainly never concluded he didn't fix games. And the NBA simply said, we're unable to contradict the government's conclusions for reasons that I told you earlier. The NBA study was more limited than the FBI's. And, and of course, he may have missed calls intentionally rather than made bad calls. Right. And the, the allegation that pro gamblers were making, the ones who I interviewed for the book, they, when they were looking at games, their assertion was that Donaghy was making what are technically correct calls that other referees don't make. So there are plenty of violations that are routinely overlooked. Well, he had a reputation for calling a lot of calls anyway. Ironically, if you go back and revisit what David Stern, the NBA commissioner, says about the scandal, he says two things, which are right in line with the pro gamblers would tell you, which is that Donaghy, A, was in the top tier of accuracy among NBA officials, and B, made among the top three in calls made for the NBA. Well, that's exactly why the pro gamblers thought this was never going to be discovered, because if he was making correct calls, they're not going to be raising red flags for any officials who are going to review the games. Now, here's a guy who's making, I think, $267,000 exactly right a year as, as a professional referee. Why would he risk everything for what started out as $2,000 a game, a winning game, a winning mm -hmm. pick, um, and... and quickly became $5,000 a game. I mean, he was making good money. He was, and by the way, that $260,000 a year was just for the regular season. There were bonuses with the playoffs that he was making, so he was making good money. There's a complicated answer to that also. His claim, of course, is that he was addicted to gambling, and that's why he was willing to throw it all away. People close to Donaghy, who I've interviewed over the years, and people who work with him, claim that this is just what he does, that he was always greedy. It had nothing to do with a gambling addiction. If you go back and look at his you know, life before gambling and before the NBA, I think this, you point, is, uh, this you is just who he is. And you point out in your book that uh, he paid somebody to take his SATs. Right, right. And in fact, uh, during the uh, negotiations with the FBI, the, dis the discussion resol not, didn't revolve around, but included who took the SATs for him. Now, you, you say in your book that, that this story is one of the most consequential scandals in U.S. sports history. That, how so? Because prior scandals have typically involved players. So there's a, maybe a, a scandal involving college players who were paid to fix a game or to alter an outcome of a game. You don't see pro players involved in a scandal like that, and you never see officials who've actually been alleged to have actually fixed games, let alone, as I explain in the back end of the book, the overwhelming evidence that games actually were fixed as part of the scandal. That typically doesn't happen. I mean, it was a big scandal when Pete Rose was betting on games, but no one was alleging that games were actually fixed. This is a remarkable story because there's clear evidence, or I shouldn't say clear, but certainly overwhelming evidence, that those games were fixed to advance his bets. You say that there were a number of reasons why bookies, the NBA, the Fed, all should have... Uh, seen the red flags long before they did. Why didn't people see this sooner? Well, some people did. The offshore sports books who were taking these large bets did. Uh, the lopsided bets with millions of dollars on, on one side. Exactly, because what happens, it's hard to explain in a, in a short amount of time like this, but for professional gamblers, there's a, there's a website, there's a subscription service called Don Best. And the Don Best actually allows a, the subscriber, by the way, it's 50, currently $5,200 a year to subscribe to this website, but it's worth it. It's the cost of doing business here if you're a gambler. And it provides you real-time, second-by-second updates on betting line activities for every game around the world. And so if a, a particular game starts experiencing a lot of money on one side of a proposition and the betting line moves quickly and moves by a significant amount, Pro gamblers understand what that means. They don't need to know the particulars, they just follow the money. And so people start copying bets. And that's how Batista found out about Donaghy's games. He just simply started copying bets. He didn't quite understand exactly what was going on, but he knew that he knew those games were winning and he was smart betting. People then started copying Batista's bets. So by the time you get to the 06-07 season, as I explain in the book, I know of at least seven pro gamblers 
who are betting large sums of money on these games. I, I want to get back real quickly to uh, to Black Brothers Inc. And, and writing that book and writing this book. You actually said when you wrote Black Brothers Inc. Uh, that enough time had passed, that, that the characters involved in all of this uh, weren't afraid to talk and, in fact, were anxious in some cases to talk to you. What was the situation here? That's a great question. This is totally different. That's a great question. And that's why in Black Brothers, I didn't change any names. Everything that's written is exactly as it was historically. This time, when I was hanging out in Las Vegas, meeting with people who were what are called runners, they're the people who have placed bets on behalf of pro gamblers. They literally sit in sports books in Las Vegas waiting for that phone call, go bet X number of dollars on this game. So I spent time out there interviewing them. I spent time with other professional gamblers. They gave me access to their betting records, their accounts. The only way I could get that kind of access was if I agreed to change their names in the book. And the readers are told which ones are changed. But uh, this was much more touchy and had to be more carefully written and out of concern for people who were kind enough to show me the world. So, so let, let's end. How do professional gamblers, how do they feel about the book? And how does the average gambler, and, and so many Americans are sports gamblers, how do they feel about the book? Well, we're three months into, the book came out almost exactly three months ago, and I've actually gotten more response from gamblers than I have from regular uh, sports fans. I think there's a reason for that. I think people always wondered what the multimillionaire gamblers do for a living. There are always whispers about these people, but no one ever really understood. Are they real? Is it a lot of it exaggerated? Is the role of inside information exaggerated? And if so, how does that play out? No one has ever spoken to these people before, let alone hung out with them and understand that sociology. So I've been fascinated, A, by the pro gamblers who are proud that people know about what they're doing, uh, but more so by the average gambler. If you check gambling message boards uh, and things like that, they are just totally blown away by this world that they thought existed. Um, people who used to copy betting lines but didn't know quite why, well, now they'll know why. It's, it's been fascinating. For some, I'm not a gambler, and yet I've really enjoyed understanding how it all works. Of course, I'd also say to anyone who considers gambling, if these professional gamblers consider winning 56% of their games a great percentage, it means the average gambler has no chance. No chance at all. <laughs> because we don't Save have your money. we Save don't we money. don't have the you know the researchers working for us. We don't have computer models. You know these people take this very seriously. All right. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Sean Patrick Griffin. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find an excerpt from Griffin's book, Gaming the Game. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed Conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.